I'm Eric Chummy, and this is Politely Pushy. Welcome to Politely Pushy. I'm your host, as always, Eric Chummy. Today, my guest is Neil Hughes. He's the founder, host, CEO, the everything man of the podcast Tech Talks Daily. And, and you're doing so much more than that, as I as I briefly learned uh, you know, yesterday as we were getting organized here. I love this podcast because I've never met you before. I'm yeah. seeing you for the first time, except for the the four minutes we got, just making sure our mics were good. So I love diving in, not knowing anything. Like we're truly meeting for the first time, as opposed to you know sometimes you do podcasts with people that you've known for a while. So you're trying to come up with a conversation. You're trying to figure out what might be interesting to the audience, but maybe you've heard that that story already. So Neil, thank you for for taking the dive with me today. No, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me today and uh, a conversation that we don't know where it's going to go. And that makes it all the more better for me. I like that you didn't worry about prepping it so much. I, I know some people, they won't come on unless you spend an hour with them prepping through everything and they script it out. And, you know, different personalities need different amounts of prep. So I appreciate your your uh, winging it approach. But, no you know, it's... That. I was just going to say, I think the, the the weird thing for me is I'm the podcast host guy. So being on the other side here as you're asking me questions, that feels a little bit strange. But I suppose having done nearly, what, 3,000 interviews now, I'm kind of aware that every single guest is different. And sometimes it's best just to put the pen and paper down and uh, have a conversation. So That's again, what I was going to say. That I was going to say, it's usually it's rare that I interview another person who has their own podcast, right? Usually if they have their own vehicle, they're, they're doing that. You mentioned 3,000 interviews. Yeah. I think about a bell curve. I think about the spectrum. That means 2% of them were amazing, right? That's 60 of them. 2% of them were just doggone awful, right? And, <laughs> and, and I'm curious, when do you know in an interview, how many minutes does it take for you to realize this is going to be a real disaster versus this is going to be amazing? Is it, is it right away or does it take some time to build that up? I guess it's very similar to what you were just saying. Some guests I can hop on, uh, hop on a call. We have that rapport straight away and we bounce things around and it feels like two old friends having a conversation. That is when a podcast is working at its best. But as you said, some people like to prepare. Some people like to over prepare and some people, they may ask for questions in advance and you give them the questions in advance. It's just a bit of a guideline to help you through the conversation. And they've just got a complete scripted response for absolutely everything in front of them. And I understand sometimes it's people from non-English speaking languages. So it's a lot, lot tougher. But when you hear somebody talking and replying like this, like they're clearly reading, that is my worst nightmare. So <laughs> that's when I know it's going to be a, a disaster. Equally, when I've got a guest where I just hit it off with, and maybe can have a little bit of cheeky fun with, along with um, talking about very serious subjects. And it does feel that that natural organic conversation, as you said yesterday in an email, just two guys sat in a coffee shop having a, a conversation. That, that's what it should be about. How much editing will you do? How much will you cut out bad stuff? Or do you just keep it, this is what it is. This is the podcast. Yeah, there's a few things. Um, I, I try not to edit too much. There's a there's lots of software now where you can remove filler words. Now, if I've got somebody that says, um, like, you know, one or two times or five or six times, I'm not going to touch that. But if I've got somebody that says, you know, for like 82 times, and I think the most filler words I had on a 30-minute episode once was 500. Now, clearly, 500 filler, filler words is way, way too much. So I will edit that. But things like just tightening it up if there's a, a three, four-second gap as the guest thinks about things. So it's more about tightening things up a little bit than than heavy editing. Because I think if you overdo it and if you remove every single filler word and every single gap, nobody talks like that. It doesn't sound like a conversation anymore. Right. Then it sounds too perfect. It doesn't yeah. sound human. So you have to put some imperfections in there. What is the current business model on podcasts right now in terms of your experience? Have you had to change the business model? Is it is it ads? Is it sponsors? Is it, you know, guests that pay? Is it, you know, is it a feeder for other things? Because you hear so many stories now about, okay, well, in order to be a successful podcast, you need X, but that's yeah. different from maybe what they would have said five years ago, certainly different from 10 years ago. How are you navigating the business side of it? 
Well, for me, I would say the podcast should never be your business. Your business should be your business. And your podcast is almost a complement of that, where you direct people back to your business, let people get to know you, let them know what you're all about without you selling anything to them. They just say, oh, this person knows what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. They've got their expertise. And then they naturally might navigate to your business. Podcasting is a, a business model. I don't want to be the guy to say this, but it's not going to happen. Very, very few make it. I, th I think on average, the average podcast uh, or anybody that starts up, if they have a, a once a week podcast, they're probably going to be getting between two and 500 downloads a month. Now, if you've got it, the first thing people say to me is, oh, Neil, I've started this podcast. How do I monetize this? And first of all, I say, you've done seven episodes. You know, you can't monetize anything after seven episodes. <laughs> You need to put the grind. You need to serve your audience for hundreds of episodes, and then little by little, you become a part of somebody's routine. They show up the same time you deliver the content, and then little by little, those numbers go up and up and up. But they're still not going to go up to these two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand an episode that you see in the charts. And I was also at a um, a podcast event here in the UK, and I was chatting with someone, and they were saying that the reality stars here in the UK that they may have been on TV. They've got 3 million followers, 4 million followers, and they their next move is, right, we're going to take these 4 million followers and start a podcast. But many are finding that they do four, five, six episodes, and that audience doesn't follow them to the podcast. There's no quick fix. So as a result, many are starting to do video because video is more engaging and get more views. But then that's not a podcast. So... <laughs> Business model, I would say, serve your audience for a length of time, build up that back catalogue. Your show's going to be, it's going to evolve. It's going to be much better after episode 50 than episode one. And little by little, as you become an expert in your niche, you will start to be offered things like ads or sponsored posts and, and, and all those wonderful things. And you can slowly start monetizing. But it's a long, hard slog. I mean, I've been doing this. I think I launched my podcast in 2015. So it's a long way down the road, you know. So I wouldn't I wouldn't start a podcast thinking, hey, I'm going to be the next YouTuber or the next big podcast guy. Well, everyone be. thinks they, they're going to be Joe Rogan or something yeah, like yeah. that. You see these celebrities or people that you haven't heard of, they become celebrities because of the podcast. Or I think about Lex Friedman out of yeah. nowhere, right? Millions of YouTube downloads for what is effectively a podcast. And... And, and I think people think, hey, that could be me, right? I, I yeah. could do that. And I would say it could be you, but behind that, well, I think very often we celebrate the, the person stood at the top of the summit of the mountain. You know, it's, it's got all these successes or she's got all these successes and all these followers and all this engagement and they're, they're living the dream and you want to follow that. But what we don't celebrate is that long climb to the summit, that 10-year overnight success story of, serving your audience and and doing those interviews, speaking with people, getting to know people. That's where the magic happens. That's where you learn your trade. So, yeah, it's not an overnight thing. And no matter what anybody tells you, there are no shortcuts. I get all the emails saying, hey, Neil, we can, uh, we can make you that huge, huge podcast star. And then I look at their social channels and they've got like 32 Instagram followers or something. You know, I think <laughs> if you can't do it for yourself, how are you going to do it for me? Yeah. Yeah, no, I get that. 3,000 episodes, you're almost 10 years into this. Did you ever think about giving up? Because 3,000, I mean, oh, that's like 300 a year. So that is effectively every day. And you said tech talks daily. So you're doing it every day. There's got to be a grind. There's got to be a burnout. There's got to be points where you think, why am I still doing this? But I don't get the guests. Maybe there's days or there's seasons of life. These aren't the guests I wanted. These aren't the topics I wanted. These aren't the downloads I wanted. There's got to be moments of the fork in the road where you think about, do I keep going? I think the only time I had that fear, because I, I love what I do, I'm very fortunate. And the only time I had that fear was when I very first started. And I think for the first 20 episodes, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Some were solo episodes, some were talking about topical tech trends, but then of course they're not evergreen. So they date very quickly. Then I wanted to do interviews. And it wasn't until I got to, I think it was about episode 40, that I was like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I want to do interviews but then getting people to come on the show, that was hard work. But now I'm in a very fortunate position 10 years later. Of, I've currently got, I mean, we're recording this early July. I've currently got 100 interviews booked in until mid-October. I'm getting 60 
pictures to come on every single day. My biggest problem and the thing that I hate is turning people down. I kind of created a, a platform to help people and give startups to big businesses that voice and to share their story. And I'm the fact that I'm turning people away, that's what I hate more than anything. And it's weird. If you find something you love, they say you never have to work again. And for me, it's I do two two episodes a day a day i record monday to friday so 10 episodes a week but to me it's more than daily it's double daily well i do two a day so 10 a week and that covers me if i get sick if i get a few cancellations if i just don't feel like it or there's a family crisis so i've got 10 a week in the bag and i'm about two weeks ahead at all times so that's why and as I said, it doesn't feel like work. And to me, it doesn't feel like a podcast. It's two 30-minute calls. And it, I think everybody's got time to hop on a call right. for 30 minutes, learn something from someone, and then put it out there. I think when we put the podcast label on, it becomes something else. But it shouldn't be that. It should just be a conversation where you're learning something. Right, right. I, and I noticed you're, I noticed because we're on video, right? I saw your light go down for a little bit, but we're going to roll with that. If your light goes out again, we keep going. Um, <laughs> so then tell me, Who's your ideal guest, favorite kind of pitch you want to see when, when you might say, okay, you know what? This is so good. I'm going to jam you in tomorrow because I'm not going to put you on October. I, I want you now. This is what I've been dreaming of that, that I could do. What is that for you? Oh, well, first of all, I'll say the guest that I don't want is the self-promotional guest that I am the best person in the world. My business is the best. Our AI solution is the best. I'm not about that at all. No, nobody would ever do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants that, you know? So I, I'm more about just sitting down with someone and finding out. I suppose really what I should do here is tell you the story behind the podcast. So I was an IT guy 15 years ago, and I was in those corporate meeting rooms where the business says, We've got this problem. We need to fix it. Maybe we should have AI or a mobile app, and then IT would have to present and say, don't worry about the technology. Tell me about your problem. But very quickly, that turned into a battle of acronyms of SQL licenses, PowerShell scripts, and, and all these different acronyms. And you could see these people that didn't know too much about technology were just suddenly thinking about what they wanted to eat for their their evening meal because they just didn't understand. And there's this huge disconnect, almost like speaking different languages. So I wanted to be the bridge between those two worlds. So, And the reason I explain that is because I think my perfect guest is someone that says, hey, this is a business problem. This is what everyone's talking about. But I'm talking to lots of people, and this is how we're tackling that problem. Because I don't want it to be me promoting myself or the guest promoting their self. I, I would love to solve a real-world problem. but have a little bit of fun along the way. I always finish my podcast with a, a more lighthearted question, like who would you like to have lunch with or a uh, funny or interesting story, a song for our Spotify playlist. So we talk about real stuff. We solve in real problems, but also having a bit of fun along the way. So that's my kind of ideal guess. Yeah. You didn't start off as a media guy. You started as, as an IT guy. So did you ever expect, you know, as a kid or when you started in IT, hey, one day I'm going to be this, tech media <laughs> mogul i'm sure you never thought about that this must have been an accident in a lot of ways well it was I and mean, it wasn't you know that steve jobs quote where uh he said you can't you can't join up the dots looking forward it's only when you look back so if i look at 16 year old me i remember going to a careers advice and uh, meeting and the the teacher says what do you want to do and we'll help you do that and i was like oh, i want to be a writer that's what i want to do i want to write about things that i'm passionate about and they go eh. You're not really academic enough for that. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, knock me down. How to destroy a kid at 16, you know? And then it was like, you know what? I quite fancy, um, and this is a bit left field, but I quite fancy exploring radio and going into hospital radio, learning my craft and going out there. They went, yeah, yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, and anyway, I, I ended up in IT, traditional IT route, and then went, ended up in IT management. But then those passions came back to me. I started writing about those experiences in those meeting rooms, talking about technology in a language everyone can understand. And then this was 2015. I had a knock from LinkedIn, and they said, Neil, we want to make you the LinkedIn top voice in technology. And I was the number two tech writer on the whole of LinkedIn. My machine uh, lit up like a Vegas slot machine. I was getting loads of different uh, CEOs wanting me to ghostwrite for them. So from there, I was ghostwriter and writing in my own name. I was writing for Inc. Magazine at the time by night, and then IT guy by day. And then 
fast forward a few more months, uh, the following year, uh, one of my ghostwriting clients <laughs> won a top voice on LinkedIn award too. And it was that, that was the moment that I thought, okay. But that was I your mean, writing though. They won the award yeah. because of what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. It was a yeah. bittersweet moment of a ghostwriter. You know, your clients getting all the plaudits. I got absolutely nothing that year, which was quite amusing as well. But so from there, I thought, I've got something here. So I'm going to leave the day job behind. And then I was magazine writer, um, doing podcasts, and it all kind of evolved there. But if I look back to my 16-year-old self, I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do at 16. I'm writing about things that I love, and I'm doing my own radio show from a, a spare room almost. That is amazing, right? So you yeah. have to find some way of getting back in touch with those guidance counselors and say, hey, <laughs> look who was right. Who needed school? I didn't need your advice. And the weird thing is none of it was some master plan or meticulous plan that I worked towards. It all just kind of happened by accident. And in some ways that makes it all the more special. And you, as I said, the Steve Jobs quote, you, you can't join up the dots till you look back. What Are you still doing the ghost writing then? What else are you doing right now? So you do the podcast, you're do, doing writing under your name. Or are you still doing ghost writing? How does it work? What's the what's the Neil ecosystem right oh, now? Oh, man. So I do the Daily Tech podcast, obviously. And then I write six or seven articles in my own name for various online publications about the latest tech trends. And then on top of that, I ghost write for my clients. And then also I run about 15 podcasts for other businesses and entrepreneurs who are like, Neil, we want a podcast. We know how to go on a Zoom call or a MS Teams call, but I don't want to I don't want to know how I get it on Spotify, how I get it on Apple Podcasts, how do I edit audio files or set an RSS feed up. So I say, you just go and have that conversation. I'll take care of all the other stuff. So, yeah, there's never – I I, suppose, I think I work seven days a week and always on a laptop, but uh, – I love it, so it doesn't feel like work. That's a, that's a lot of work. When you start doing podcast production and management for others, that that's a lot of editing and a lot of just dealing with the files and the uploads and getting all the content right, all the elements of that. That must that must be a time consuming thing. Uh, I I'll just go ahead and ask my question: Is it a time consuming thing? And then and then B, are you trying to use AI to make that process a lot simpler oh. and quicker? AI makes everything so much easier and quicker. And as with anything with AI, I would always say there's got to be a huge disclaimer of um, don't get over-reliant on it. It will make it, make you lazy and it will do you more harm than good. But in the right way, as a tool, as a co-pilot, as a lot of tech businesses are calling it right now, it can dramatically help. For example, when I do my, my podcast, I've got a tool called Fathom AI, which plugs into Zoom. That gives me an entire transcript and key takeaways of everything in that article. So if I take that information along with, uh, I don't know, the email that was setting up the guest, if this is what the guest's about, this is their bio, I can put all that into um, a, a, an AI assistant of your choice and say, can you write me an intro outro to this guest? Uh, well, the, so you have a tool that, they, that makes a transcript. And once you have the transcript, then make me an intro outro yeah. make me a summary based on the full transcript yeah or, or, the, or the key takeaways or just a brief right. summary al along with the bio and all that other stuff just dump it all in as a big brain dump and ask you to write it and then don't read that out verbatim because it, it will be awful but straight away you're further along because you can say oh okay that's good and you can edit it very quickly in your own style so that gets you further along then when i've got that audio file i can run it through something like Descript. And that will scan the entire document, gives you uh, a transcript, and it will say, these are all the filler words and how many times they've been mentioned. And it will literally say, you know, was mentioned 200 times, uh, um, was mentioned 100 times. And you can make that choice of, does it need that extra edit or not? If you say yes to all of it and remove all of it, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, it won't sound great at all. So you've got to be a bit, there's a bit of a responsibility with that. Then there's an Adobe tool where you can put the audio through and it will just tighten it up a little bit. There's various little uh, knobs that you can slide along, which will make it sound a lot better. And then once I've got that, then I sit down to edit. And it should just be a case of me having one earphone in, watching the TV, talk to my wife, and just slightly listening for any huge mistakes. Other than that, <laughs> it will go. That's, That's how I get the truth comes out. I'm watching TV, talking to my wife, and, and I've got one ear on this. <laughs> yeah. And, 
and I, I suppose because I've done so many, I can right. I can even look at the sound in Audacity where I do my editing. Oh, the actual sound file, yeah, the picture can, of the sound, yeah. Yeah, I can see something and know exactly that that is a long um, or, or something like that. Five hundred, mm-hmm. you know, is in thirty minutes. Yeah, like ten a minute. No, ten a minute would be three hundred. Yeah. So you're at like seventeen a minute. That's yeah. a lot. And when I'm listening to a conversation, I'm I'm listening out for those. Oh, this person, that's their um, filler word. So like is another one. Man, it's sometimes you get people say two, three hundred like and like and like. <laughs> so I remove those if there's a lot of them. If they say it a few times, then it's fine. So you know, um, like, <laughs> like you know, <laughs> like you know, one of the questions that that you know I I might have, uh, I am curious. When you are in such a flywheel of all this information, the podcast twice a day, these conversations, the ghost writing, your own writing, managing other podcasts that you now have to listen to, you're just listening to so much tech and business all the time. Is there a storyline that you think, despite all of that, is still being underreported? It's still not being talked about enough. Oh, that is a good one. I suppose the two big trends at the moment are uh, AI and sustainability. They're the big trends at the moment. But I think AI has got a well-documented energy uh, resource problem. It consumes so much energy. It consumes so much water um, for energy cooling. And I urge anyone that's not heard about this is to look it up. I don't think that's discussed enough because on the flip side, we've got AI using so much resources and that, I was reading before we came on the podcast, it's expected to increase by 10,000 times over the next couple of years. So we've got one one side of us talking about ESG scores and sustainability, and the other side, the AI thing. And then also with the global warming or climate change, the world's getting hotter, but we've got um, air conditioning. We turn that air conditioning up, or you guys do in the US. You don't feel it anymore. But the, the irony is, the more you turn that air conditioning up, the hotter the planet goes. So I think we don't talk enough about technology's responsibility or the responsibility of using it and also how maybe we can invest in greener technology and start to make a difference. I, I suppose one of the reasons I'm bringing that up is here in the UK, we build our houses to keep us nice and warm, which is great. But when we have a day like today where inside this house, it's 30 degrees Celsius, which probably be about 90 degrees Fahrenheit at the minute. I've turned my fan off to do this podcast and I'm starting to sweat a little bit. So uh, I think there's a lot we could do around that and it needs uh, a, a brighter light being shined on that. I think. You know, it's the, the filters are good, right? I don't <laughs> see the sweat on you. And I think the audio filters are good too. I think you could have left the fans on if you want. I'll wait, go turn the fans on. I think Let's, the microphone will not, will not pick it up. I have, I have two fans on in try. my room. Oh, do you? Okay, right. So fan is on. Can you hear anything? No. Oh, man. So I've been sweating for no reason. And you're the pro. <laughs> you're the pro. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like to, you know, sweat for my craft. That's <laughs> what can I yeah. say. I, I have noticed Zoom is good too. I mean, we're doing this on StreamYard, but I noticed that the filters inside the audio on the software do a good job of filtering out fans or construction sounds. I think a lot of things outside of the voice yeah. bandwidth, voice frequencies, I think it does a good job of wiping those out. So I I never hesitate to put a fan on. I've got air conditioning going and a ceiling fan here because otherwise I would be I would be dead up here in the attic. So I yeah. I, I never think about it. You say I've done 3,000 episodes. I don't know how many you've done, but I've learned something from you today. So that's glad. what the podcast is about, right? <laughs> I'm glad. No, I've, I've done... Is it four digits? I don't know. Oh, if it's wow. Four digits. I don't think it's four digits. I'm sure it's it's definitely three digits. I don't know if it's four. If you count TV segments, then we're yeah. probably in four digits, right? There's so, an argument that they should be count as double, really, yeah. TV segments. But what about a storyline that you hear too much of? That you roll your eyes when you say, oh, here we go again with, with X. What is that? <laughs> I've got to say AI, but at the same time, we don't talk about AI enough because I think it is a huge, huge game changer. But I come to the US a lot for tech conferences. I've been to five or six this year, Vegas three or four times. And 
every single time you get the CEO comes out and they will say, you know, AI is not new. We've been working on it for 15 years and this is why our solution is the best and this is why AI is the future. I kind of roll my eyes there because it's clear there's a lot of bandwagon jumping. Everyone just wants to be part of that AI narrative. But as regards, so just selling new solutions, I think we we talk about too much. There's a lot of solutions out there that say, hey, we're AI, but if you look a bit deeper under the hood, there is no AI in there. Um, but I think we just need to get back to focusing on, hey, what problems are we solving here? Chat GPT, Gen AI, it's great, yeah, but what are we solving? What, what, how's this going to improve my business day and, and, and things like that? So I think we we get distracted by shiny technology sometimes rather than what it can do. What is your favorite AI tool in the in the dimension of the chat GPT, Claude, world? What do you like using the best right now? This is where I, I think there is no one, one AI assistant that is perfect for every task. If you're a developer, I suspect Claude might be better. If you just want to do some quick uh, writing or reporting, then maybe chat GPT, Google Gemini, we shouldn't forget that as well. But I think I like them all, and I do flick between ChatGPT and Claude the most. Claude I'm relatively new to, but it feels more human, more authentic. And what I love most about it is it will give you sources to what it finds. ChatGPT is like the person sat at the bar that shouts confidently and loudly I've about been getting everything. Sources, though. In my recent ChatGPT usage, I've been getting sources, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Claude. But, but that's uh, new. That's new. Yeah. And yeah. Claude has been doing that for a little longer, so it, I prefer that sometimes. But I do go between the two, depending on what I want to do. Well, the big takeaway, really, is use them all, play with them all, see what works, what doesn't work for you. But please don't over-rely on it, because if it's a, a job application letter, whether it's a an article on LinkedIn, there's key phrases that we all know by now, like delve and tapestry that it seems to put into every <laughs> paragraph you need to make that stuff your own because there are a lot of ai checkers and they're not great they, they don't deliver perfect results but it's getting quite easy to spot hey that's just a generic piece uh word salad where no, no one's really saying anything they're not tackling the problem they're not talking about a solution that there's just nothing in it it's just soulless and empty so you need to put yourself in there by all means use it to improve your writing but don't rely on it and uh, don't sacrifice your style and your authentic self. Do you think in five or 10 years, though, it will be much better? It won't be word salad. It can say, okay, I know what Neil Hughes's style is because I've seen a thousand of these articles. I can write exactly like Neil and it and it is not going to say delve in tapestry. Like, do you think that's <laughs> that's coming? It could do. I know Stephen King highlighted that if somebody put all of his books into Jack GPT, which has probably already been done, and said, write me a, a novel in Stephen King's style, it could do it quite easily. And, and So, yeah, I, it is a concern. I, I do wonder where it goes, but I like to think the human writing and the human element and unique personality, I like to think that that will never be replaced. But... You just don't know because the, the pace that it is evolving is, is just phenomenal. There's also the realization that it might not move this slow again. You know, it's just going to keep getting faster right. and faster and better and better. I mean, what kind of societal impact does that have? And how do we ensure that everyone uses it as a co-pilot and, and not to replace people with? Because we all know business leaders that will go, okay, so I can get this to do all their work and I don't need them anymore. And that's completely the wrong thing to do because I think it's people and AI doing what they can't do on their own, but doing it together better. That's where the magic happens. But I think that message gets lost sometimes. I was going to say, because you have so many businesses that you are doing communications as a human that you could see someone saying, oh, I don't need a ghostwriter. I'll just yeah, get yeah. AI to do it and then I'll edit it at the end. Or, you know, and here I said, you know, now it's in my head. <laughs> or for example... I don't need him to do the podcast because we'll just record it and we'll have AI do the transcript and the summary and the uploads for us. In a way, AI is your competition. You've got a lot of communication businesses that that you don't want AI to wipe you out, even though you want to use it to help you. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And I, but I did have someone recently send me something, and they said, "Now I don't need you to write the whole article. I just need you to tidy this up that I wrote yesterday." And I put it through an AI checker. Ninety nine percent of it was it was AI, <laughs> you know? so I could tell straight away. But I, I think the point is that if you want to be successful in anything, it is about something that AI cannot compete. It's your unique self. And yes, AI is going to come along and it might take away some of those mundane tasks. But if you want to be an expert in your particular field with a unique viewpoint, you've got a unique history of experiences, that is the magic that will ensure that you always do well. I mean, I started out as just tech blog writer. That was my niche. I niche down. I'm tech blog writer guy. I write tech articles for myself and for other people. That's what I do. But as this technology has evolved, so have I. I now... I've got a daily tech podcast. I edit podcasts for other people. I moderate uh, panels at conferences. and So there's so many different areas it, it opens up for you. I, I almost think of it like a, a video game where you go in and you've got this closed world. And then as you do certain things, other parts of that world open up. So you just got to keep evolving, keep adapting, but always be yourself and, and maintain that side of you. You say you do two episodes a day yeah. that you record. Are they always at the same time? Or are you flexible on time? So I open up my calendar from 8 in the morning till 6 p.m. And every day there's allowed, there's allowed to be two podcasts booked during oh, that time. Somewhere in there. Anywhere somewhere in there. there. Okay. Any point in that. Ideally, from my side, it's better to have it in the afternoon. I have two podcasts in the afternoon. And my writing and creative work is in the morning. And that is usually what happens. Creative writing work in the morning, podcasts in the afternoon. Because most of my guests are from the U.S. or the UK, but I do get people a, a lot more recently from Asia, Australia, etc. So they want that early morning slot, that 8 a.m. slot. So, yeah, I, anyway, for me, it's just two phone calls a day, two 30 minute phone calls a day. And uh, let's see what we can learn. Then, my next question as it relates to guests, what do you want to hear from guests? What do you want to see from them? What, what makes for a better episode? Not necessarily. Well, there's maybe two dimensions. The ones that you personally like, right? That's one version of better. And then there's the ones that get more numbers, get more downloads. Sometimes those aren't, don't necessarily correlate. But but what do you find makes you happiest? And what do you find gets the best numbers? Well, first of all, I'm going to bust a few myths here because I've had some big names on the podcast over the years. Star Trek's William Shatner, TV's Wendy Williams, Gary Vaynerchuk, Guy Kawasaki, John Scully, some big names. In, you heard of all in, of them, yeah. All the, all the world of tech. They don't get the best download numbers. Really? They don't at all. You, you, when I first got them, I thought, wow, I'm going to be a superstar. My, my right. figures are going to triple, quadruple overnight. They don't. Barely barely any noticeable difference because those guests, they do 10, 12, 13 interviews a week. They're not sharing that interview on LinkedIn or, or their Twitter with a million followers. They don't do that. So it's it's just down to your existing audience that will pick up on it. So you, they don't go down as well as people think. So I'll, I'll bust that myth straight Wait, away. But before you move on, is it because they don't share it on themselves or is it because they do so many that people can find them in other places? If they shared it and still did 12 a week, but if they shared yours, would you get the pickup? Yeah, you'd probably get the pick up then. But I think the other problem that you've got, if they do 12 episodes a week, and if you were to go and listen to those 12 interviews of whatever celebrity it might be, they've got a bit of shit going on. They've got the same talk that they take on the road at conferences that they say on podcasts. It's the same generic answers to the same generic questions again and again and again. There's nothing new there. So I, I've seen that. I, I've heard, I know what you're saying. I've listened to the same people show up on different podcasts and they're just repeating themselves. It's almost like a a stand-up comedian who has their joke and they're yeah. just telling it to different audiences. The only difference now is we record them. Yes, 100%. Whereas if you've got someone that's their authentic self and they have a cracking story, and I've had people that were that, that were thrown into the Navy SEALs and the CIA and they've got a real exciting backstory or something that changed their, their world. I had a guy, he was a, from Thailand, I think, and he had a startup. He went flew all the way to the US to pitch that that big startup to an investor, and he threw everything into it. His last uh, few dollars, and he, he finished finished his pitch, and they said, "No, sorry, we're not going to invest." He was crestfallen, absolutely heartbroken. And then when he was going back home, he was waiting at the uh, the baggage carousel. Someone said, "Hey, are you okay?" And uh, he got talking to this guy. He ended up being an angel investor that invested in his business, and. Uh, 
Uh, it went from strength to strength. I've had another guy who had a great idea, but he just needed a developer. He ended up sat next to the developer on uh, on the plane. So I think it's that curious side, those great human stories, and how the universe almost almost gives everyone a little nudge in the right direction. And you need to be open to those ideas, but and open to those little signs. But I think they go down really well. So my other podcast has always been from episode one technology works best when it brings people together so yes we're going to talk about tech yes we're going to talk about problems but we're also going to have a bit of fun and and talk about relatable stories and i've not always been the ceo of of this huge fortune 100 company i started out um, i think it was john scully uh, the guy that famously went up to steve jobs went up to him and said do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life at Pepsi or do you want to come with me and um, come with me and change the world, he said. So he was telling me how he used to get up at three o'clock in the morning working for Pepsi, doing on all the trucks, loading the trucks up, going from place to place. And I, I, again, I think those stories are so important. Not the the person at the top of that mountain, hey, that aren't they successful, but that, that climb and the, the grind, as you said at the beginning of our chat. Bust some more myths for me, though. You were, you were going to bust a couple more myths. Oh, all right. So what else, what else have we got there? Because um, I was saying, what, what is the best guest for you? What do you want to see from a guest? And then you said the big celebrities don't move the needle. I said, what makes you happiest and what tends to get the best numbers? Yeah. So the best numbers are the human stories. And there's no hiding from this. It's you. Can, I can get a, an interview. It could be the best interview in the world. And I can share it with my audience and my audience will see it. But it's, I always try and work with the company, work with the guest. If they share it on their LinkedIn and say, hey, I'm really proud of this interview that I've done. And then all their people that are working for them, they'll like it. They'll share it. That will move the needle. And then if you've got the business, let's say that business is, I don't know, Adobe, Accenture or Deloitte, and they share it on their LinkedIn channel, that will increase engagement. And maybe somebody else might discover you from there. So what moves the needle? You, you're I can do so much of it, but then the guest and whoever their business is that's representing. And it's very much a case of rinse, wash, repeat. I share it. We'll break it up into little pieces. We can share it across my socials. They do the same. If you do that time and time again, show up every week doing that same thing, and you have that buy-in where you work as a team to promote that episode, that is ultimately what moves the uh, the needle on there rather than anybody trying to sell you a quick solution because they just – have a, a bot farm in a part of the world where everyone just hits play and leaves it. So if you really want to genuinely move the needle, that's the best way. So uh, what do I like most? I'm, I suppose I'm a bit of a cheeky chappy. I like to have a bit of fun along the way. So people <laughs> that are, uh, are just down to earth and um, don't take themselves too seriously. And we can have a bit of fun along the way. That's, that's the kind of thing that, that makes me happiest because technology can be a dry subject. You know, it's, it's an acquired taste. And if we've got a business leader listening and it's just all acronyms and uh, and stuff like that and licenses, no one's going to want to hear that. So you've got to bring it to life and, and have a bit of fun. A couple of questions before we go. Number one, has the fan helped you not sweat as much now? I'm back to normal now. Okay. I'm back in the okay. room. <laughs> all right. Number two, now that you're not in tech yourself anymore, right? You're not an IT guy now. You're full media, full communications how do you stay abreast of what's really going on? Because you're not in there coding. You're not in there connecting networks. And you're, you're on the outside talking about it. How, how do you stay engaged with the material and, and stay knowledgeable? I think I'm quite fortunate that those two podcast episodes I do a day because every, every week I can have 10 episodes and they're going to be scattered right across. They could be legal tech, crypto, ed tech, property tech future tech, agriculture tech. It's a different subject every day, sometimes twice a day. I do feel like my head is going to explode. So I've got that many different things going through. So I'm learning all this stuff every day during my podcast. So that helps me so much. And for anyone listening that is struggling to keep up with the pace of technology, I would say go listen to podcasts when you're walking the dog, when you're on that commute to work. They're the times when you can learn and, and keep up to speed without having to to do too much so i learned so much there obviously i'm writing six seven articles a week uh, on the latest tech trends whether it be a hardware release whether it be a tech trend that's impacting businesses so i've got access to so much knowledge so much insights the one thing that i don't like or i would like to improve is yeah this is all great this is all what people are talking about but what is it like inside those businesses the day-to-day -day, the grind when you 
What are they dealing with? What are they talking about? So for that side of things, I go to a lot of tech conferences. Uh, if ever I get the invite, I go, I go on that show floor. I'll have 10, 11 interviews during the um, the event, but also I'll be on that show floor talking to people. Well, what is, like, what's your number one challenge at the moment? What are your customers coming to you and saying, hey, I need help with this? So collectively, I like to think I'm still in there, but I'm sure there'll be a few IT guys say, hey, he doesn't know what he's talking about anymore. But I do my best to keep up to speed on, on everything. And, and my work la- kind of feeds into that. And then lastly, as I hear all this, and, and you mentioned your wife, how do you maintain any kind of home and family balance? You said you're working seven days a week. Your calendar is booked up eight to six. How are you How are you surviving at home? I'm, I, we both consider ourselves very fortunate. So, yes, I am kind of married to a laptop a lot of the time, but I can talk. With my, my wife does not go out to the office every day either, so she's at home with me all day. So pretty much my routine looks like in the morning I'm going to be bit like jack nicholson in the shining don't disturb me i'm writing an article (laughs) i'm deep in the zone there and then once i've finished that article i'll go downstairs about 11 o'clock we'll have a drink we'll have a we'll have a few laughs we'll mess about a bit and and just unwind and then in the afternoon i've got those two podcast calls to do and in between yes there's those mounting of emails yes there's a, a bit of editing to do here and there but Again, I've got one earpiece in. I can still maintain um, a coherent conversation. And we're together all day, every day, other than when I go to tech conferences. So we kind of got the balance right. Or either that or I'm just very fortunate and she understands that's, what I do. That's good. Yeah, you can you have your best friend with you all day and you can chat yeah, yeah. while you work and get paid to have fun. That's that's pretty good. I like it. Uh, Neil, this has been fantastic. Didn't, before we go, just tell me, Tell the audience all the places they can find you. Where where are your platforms? Where will they track you down? So Tech Talks Daily is on all the usual podcasting platforms. That's kind of what every podcaster will say. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all the social channels, just at Neil C. Hughes. Same on all of them. So you'll find me nice and easy there. But if you do hear this podcast, don't just hit connect or follow Send me a little message. Let's have a conversation as well. Not about me doing anything for you, but just tell me what you're dealing with at the moment. Just to just have a chat with you. That's kind of what I enjoy doing and why I do this. And other than that, my website, if you did want to work with me, is techblogwriter.co.uk. Techblogwriter.co.uk. I love it. Neil, this has been fantastic. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's a pleasure to chat with you. I know before we got connected, our mutual friend Carol said, I adore Neil. He's the best. And, and now I see why. So thank you for the time today. No, thank you so much. Carol is an absolute star. We've worked together for many years now. She's helped me with many guests for the podcast. So it's always a pleasure working with you. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. Thank you to my guest and thanks for listening. Subscribe to get the latest episodes each week and we'll see you next time.